We do a 25 meter move at bearing 130. Wow. Oh, that's a lot. So many huge sponges. Must be a really great flow area. Some bigger corals too. Oh, oh, I saw a shadow. I was like, what is yeah. that? <laughs> large eel. You can Puhi? remember Puhi. Yeah. yeah. yeah There's large. I know, I saw the can shadow. Can we get a too, zoom? Yeah, if possible. Like, with the shadow, I was just like, am I imagining things? Well, sometimes if the organism is right against the light, it'll make it, like, even a shrimp will make the shadow. Could we do? a giant shark. Wait. This is a shark, I think. Is no, it? No, it's not, it's a, not shark. a shark. It looks a little bit like a fellow shark. I'm just like, wait a minute. No, it's not a shark. Uh, we're trying to get the whole thing in the image. There we go. Where are you? And then get a little more detail when it turns. Yeah, it's definitely an eel. Right on cue. Alright. Gotta get going. Thank you. Looks like it's in good condition. Mm -hmm. Compared to some of the other fish. Oh, no. That is impressive wall. Yeah. I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> Do you rock climb, Hannah? I know sometimes I'll hear you like look at a boulder and be like, I wish I could climb it. No, I do not rock climb. Oh, I, <laughs> I do, and I want to climb this one. Oh, wow. I just like climbing <laughs> rock formations but I have never <laughs> rock climbed I feel like if I did it would be beneficial for me but yeah I've never no I feel like you would see climb. the rock in front of you and be like ooh minerals and then fall off you guys think we should stop here no <laughs> I think um, you would no I would actually be too yeah we should probably stop for a little bit <laughs> you guys want to slow down and look around this a little bit more or should I keep moving forward yeah yeah we can do that which Maybe one? go zoom on some of these corals and well, see what they are. Let's slow down first, okay. and then we can do that. Yes. Bridge nav. But this looks like multiple flows on top of each other. I do know a lot of geologists I'll that stop, do please. rock climb. I'm already about 10 meters but I'm behind. I'm terrified behind. that I could like break a bone. Yeah, yeah there's that. That's, like that chance is never zero. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I, I've had too many broken bones in my past oh. <laughs> to... How many broken bones? How many e Three. E samples Two in the same together? spot. Dang. Um, I'm thinking eDNA might be good here because I don't think we've seen this type of coral community yeah, thus far. Han said that it would be good to take one because uh, they, they didn't on their watch. But yeah, I broke my arm playing football, hide and seek, and bike riding. Like not as far behind as it I've also like sprained my wrist playing on a trampoline and my foot getting stuck in one of the springs and then I <laughs> fell over and I landed that on a tree root. Yes, we were playing uh, the Dead Mummy Rise game. Oh yeah. Like. <laughs> That's a. Yeah, and I wasn't even the mummy. I was the person running away and I, my <laughs> foot got caught. All right. Looks like a lot of bamboos, I think. But I can't tell about a proper close up. I think it's bamboo, from what I can see. Maybe primnoids, but I'm leaning bamboo. 
I want to say with full confidence that it is bamboo, but I, I can't. <laughs> Says the geologist. Yes. <laughs> Clearly the professional opinion. Yes. Can we get a zoom on some of these? Thank you, Asako. Yes, Asako has confirmed that she thinks it's bamboo as well. Then we see the Rito Gorja to the left, the one that looks like a firework. Oh, Rito stars yeah. fall, dropping off again. Do, why do, do they do that? Because they think they're in danger? I think so. Most likely. Seems like it's when they are And then I'm seeing another one of those red crustaceans. Oh, I feel like they're like, play dead. I know, I, it's like, I know that it's not fun for them but it's really funny to see they're just like no are these bamboos just fall off it looks drop like, off uh, actually i don't know these this it might no, be a primitive it is, it is. wait do you see <laughs> yes i see can you circle it? yeah i see it never mind yeah, yeah definitely bamboo yeah nice job hannah good job hannah thank you just like how i identify by tree old little rocks no that's not the same yeah, because she, she was correct. You call botryoidal <laughs> low bait flow. <laughs> and you're laughing because it's true. But you just like to say it to... <laughs> We're going to turn this ROV <laughs> around. Rise. Yeah, it just wants to irritate you. Yes, like a sibling. Okay, so are we going to do a Niskin? Oh, wow. Yes, what? please. I'm just going to wait for the... The ship to settle out. Atlanta to stop its oh, swing. Oh, Atlanta. Okay, no worries. Yep. Sounds yeah, the good. The wall still kind of continues. Yeah. It was just reconfirming. Yep. Seems like the coral continues a little bit. So. Yeah. Yeah, mostly bamboo with an occasional primnoid and chrysogorgid. And then, I believe a hemicorallium. Looks kind of sturdy. I'm not accidentally hitting caps lock and it's feel like I'm yelling into sea log. <laughs> I love I love texting in caps lock. It's sometimes. probably a good spot. <laughs> it's definitely yelling. Yes. Or excite yeah, yelling excitement. And oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Cucumber in the back. Apparently, I was listening to the 8 to 12 last night, and Daniel, because he does the highlights, he like yeah. makes up these like funny titles he does. for all the highlights. <laughs> he does. And I was listening oh, to what he was like calling them, and I was like dying laughing. <laughs> I love that. I didn't know that. That's good. Oh, right. So I think we're gonna end this dive around 11, our uh, local time. Uh, oh, and, wide. And then. Oh, I'd wrap it back. It's like a 12 hour transit. I think we're going to launch around midnight tomorrow. Wow. So we'll, we'll, they'll probably be doing most of the launch and then descent. So we'll be, our, our next morning watch will be uh, on, the, on the ground running. Yeah. Which uh, Niskin are we going for? Um, Niskin 3. Niskin 3. Mike, was that ending the dive at the surface or off bottom at 11? Uh, I believe on surface, that's at least, you know, the whiteboard just said recover at 11. So, I, but I agree, it's a little, I think it's because we launched around then. Very bright. Uh, we're trying to see inside the vehicles. We're exposing for right there, not the biology.
This can trigger. Thank you. The sample 100. Hey. Wow. Three meters off. A hundred. <laughs> doing it again, I think. That's a lot of rocks. I love them. I love them all. <laughs> They're all special Is it pausing or the freeze just isn't working? Uh, it's the the halt button I think is starting to go again. Uh, what happened on ONC? Yep. Probably gave you nightmares. How many times we almost swung into the camera. One thing that I also notice when Hercules comes up and we go collect the samples is how cold the water is and how cold the rocks are. Really? Huh. Yes. The worst is when you think you do the lock and then you put the master or the, the parent aside. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Scott, um, we plan to rise around 11. It is currently what time? Uh, Almost 5 a.m. Almost 5, so we got another six hours or so. So about one more watch after us. It's unusual we would recover at 11 and not noon. Yeah, they they may they may shift out to oh, watch. Oh, we try and do it at a watch. Oh, on change. bottom. I um, we we, we, right, we should be on deck at eleven. I think we depart the sea floor at nine. Nine thirty. Around there. Bridge nap. Uh, can we do a ship move, please? Two zero meters at bearing one six five. So this looks like Thank low you. bait flow, and then I can't tell what flow, what type of flows. Oh, sorry, that was a Sako it. was asking. My bad. Sorry, Sako. Hannah, you were saying low bait flow here? Yes. But I was trying to figure out what this flow is in the back, because it looks like it's covering the low bait flow. And then this looks like a dike. Can you explain what a dike is? Yes, so it's an intrusion of a lava flow, and it's younger than its surrounding rock, usually. I'm not sure if I can say the same for seamounts. I was trying to talk with Dr. Val about it, and that may not always be the case. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. So. But, but it still often is. Yes. Yeah. Very much. Yes, it often is. And on we noticed on the dikes that there's jointing. So you can see the different like planes of the rock. So I thought that was cool. We do have, somebody did collect a sample from one of the dikes of, of the pass, of a pass seamount. And wow. Do you think these are all bamboo? Pretty sure. But we actually cut open one of the samples from the dike sample, and it was full of horn blend, well, amphibles, and clinopyric scenes. So another um, useful. Can we get a zoom sample. on these little orange dots on the bamboo on the left? Oh. oh. <gasps> Sorry. I did not mean to hit you hit the, the binder. Hannah, keep constantly assaulting my sample book. I, it's, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're fine. That one wasn't my chair this time, though. That was my actual elbow. All right. Um, going in for zoom? Going for zoom in? Going in. Whoa. Oh. They are small enemies. Huh. This is a super... And they are bamboo coral. Fun setup to be able to look at the ones in the back. Wow. That's a shot. Then come to the ones in the front. Is it, do you just adjust near and far focus for this? Yeah. yeah. It's this large slider I have over here. And it's super touchy. So if I move it yeah. as two millimeters maybe. <laughs> um, so I have a much better feel for if you're moving closer or further away yeah. to something than you would. 
something I try not to do. But well, that's why I usually tell you. Uh, yeah. Like if I if I'm continually having to make it nearer and nearer, I'll white tell you you're, you're coming in. Yeah. Oh, is that a crab? Because otherwise yep, it's hard white to tell. Yep. In the back, <laughs> and then to the crab. See little barnacles and as well. Coming out. It's uh, almost like a piece of art right there with those lines. So this bamboo is a, as a, is a as yet undescribed species. It stands out by the acute angles of the internodal branches and the very angular spacing of the polyps on thin tissue. Wow. So, Alia, now that we've been fortunate enough to receive our sample number 100, is there a way in to describe or language that would talk about like uh, getting knowledge as a gift or receiving a gift of knowledge? Yeah, um, there is a way to um, talk about it. Um, I think a more important way would be to actually, um, through action, because, you know, we can talk about all kinds of things, but unless we actually do it with our actions, then it becomes more embedded. So, um, yeah, you know, when we think about um, the place that we're in, Papahanao Mokuakea and its significance um, to Kanako O'iv, we are, you know, grateful to be in this space, this Aina Akua, a place that usually humans do not enter. So when you think of, you know, going up to a mountaintop or down into the depths of the sea, these are not places for humans to be, which kind of magnifies their sacredness um, because of that lack of access by humans. So when we enter these realms, so we're now in the realm of Kanaloa, um, you know, this is a sacred aina. Um, this is a sacred space. And so when we enter it, we enter it with reverence, um, with gratitude. Um, you know, when the samples are collected, we understand that these are genealogical connections for Kanako O'iwi. Um, and then when we receive the samples, we remember that as well, that we're being given gifts from a realm that we don't belong in. Um, there's, you know, there's just, this is a Hawaiian perspective. We're in a Hawaiian space. And that's what our perspective is, is that these are not places that we normally go to. So that level of reverence and that level of respect needs to be deeper um, because we're not traditionally allowed in these kind of spaces. Thanks so so much. mahalo for That's asking. Great. Yeah. And did I see on the schedule that uh, you're connecting with your colleagues at the Daniel Inouye Center we are. at some point? That's fantastic. Yeah, so today we're going to have our group from um, from NOAA, the campus over at um, Moku Ume Ume, which is um, contemporarily called um, Ford Island. Um, we'll be connecting with NOAA staff there today. So yeah, that should be awesome. And uh, that's right, great that that beautiful facility bears the name of uh, Senator Inouye. Yes, he was very instrumental in bringing um, federal funding to many, many um, programs in Hawaii. Um, Daniel Inouye, he's um, well remembered in Hawaii for his ability to work across different political parties and and uh, bring a lot of funding to Hawaii. So yeah, it's a beautiful building, LEED certified, sustainable, uh, restored two old hangars that were created um, in, into this beautiful campus. That's, if you ever get a chance, any of you check it out. The Noi, um, Inoi, Daniel K. Inoi um, NOAA campus. I do believe I visit next month. 
Oh, cool. Are you doing a tour or are you just... I gonna... believe we're doing a tour of the Marine Option Program. Oh. So, we might see you there. You might. Might see you and Hans. <laughs> this uh, weird parallel about 10 years ago, I was sailing on a vessel and we were um, sailing from there on, as you said, the modern name, Fort Island. And uh, many, many years early, earlier in uh, early 1940s, uh, grandfather had flown off of that airstrip to land on a carrier to, uh, and we shared the same destination of Kwajalein, uh, but very different missions. As a matter of fact, there's a family picture I can probably find. All right, I'm about to hop off for an interaction with an elementary school, some third graders. Oh, that sounds like mm. fun. No, I'm excited. But I'll be back soon. See you All soon. Right. See you soon. Have fun. So earlier we were talking about um, our favorite spaces on board the ship Nautilus. And um, when was it? Two days ago? I saw some Manu Oku. So these are like fairy terns. They're beautiful white birds with like deep black eyes. Um, and they actually are indicator species for voyagers. Wow. And so there were two of them that were flying off the, um, the stern. I think it was yesterday, yesterday morning. But they're great to use if you are a navigator these birds indicate the closeness of land as we're only about 25 miles um, from Kuai Helani, um, which is known as Midway. And so Polynesian voyagers use them to determine direction and closeness of land because they come out during the day and feed and hunt and then return in the evenings back to their nests. So a great kind of, um, you know, when you have environmental data that tells you things about land and um, you can follow those birds if you're ever out and you don't got any compass or GPS and you know that's how Polynesians navigated their world was that's by being cool. very attentive to those um, environmental signs. I know we were talking the other day about uh, indigenous knowledge and how uh, some things are handed down from generation to generation. And uh, I remember learning that uh, in Samoa, um, there's just been so many of those um, things that have been taught. And one of them saved tens of thousands of lives because the uh, elders had always said that when you feel the shaking of the ground, and the sea recedes to run to the high ground. And when they experienced, unfortunately, a very large tsunami in September of 2009, it was uh, that teaching that saved so many. Yeah, important, you know, life or death situations, yeah? Well, I remember when, the, was it the Banda uh tsunami? in a lot of places, especially if you have subsistence lifestyle and the sea suddenly recedes and there are fish everywhere, the first instinct is to go grab a meal. That unfortunately happened in um, Hawaii Island. I think it was like 1946 and there was a tsunami and there was a group of children that were just getting themselves into school. So this was in Lapahoehoe. And they saw that, the receding of the ocean and the flopping of all these fish that they normally would eat. Yeah. And those kids ran out to grab those fish. And unfortunately, the first wave came through. I don't know how many of those young children yeah. perished in that. Um, but it's just, you know, horrific when you think about it. It's interesting out in the um, open ocean, a tsunami like that, 
only like raised the C like six inches or so, but it moves at about 550 miles an hour. Almost like a, you know, quite literally a liquid shock wave. Uh, and then when it gets near shallow waters, it kind of shoals up and increases. It's, it's not really that, you know, 200 foot tall wave you see in the films. It's just a wave that never ends, never stops coming. In uh, early 2020, Jason was on the Atlantis. We left Panama. We were working the uh, Cayman Trough. And there was an earthquake in Jamaica that we felt on the ship and felt uh, an aftershock. But it was the most bizarre thing I've ever experienced. It's, huh. The ship rumbled as if the bow thruster was just destroying itself. Oh, wow. It's probably 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, crazy feeling. That is weird. I'm seeing a few more possible red and enemy associates on um, these colonies as well. So, Mike, uh, in your marine maritime archaeology field, have you gotten uh, uh, developed skills for identifying uh, aircraft at all? Like what they look like before they were in the ocean? What's he gone? He's gone. No, he's back there. Might have to yell his name. Yeah. Dr. Brennan. Line one. Are you on SPL right now? Uh, I am. He is not. Mm -hmm. Video's trying to talk to you. Oh, go ahead. Um, hey, are you able to identify World War II ARA aircraft? Um, like not down to the specific plane, but right, no. era, yeah. Can you see this monitor over here? I cannot. Okay. I can partially see it. Oh, yes, I can. Can you tell what that is? Uh, no. Okay. Right. Is that not a Mustang? A what? Are we Mustang? Bridge, no. That kind of curvature right there. Just curious. This bunch of bamboo is giving me um, blackberry bush vibes. So where we're at right now is part of the core original monument designation, right? No, we're in the expansion. Oh, really? Yeah. The original didn't this cover is Midway? So yeah, What's that? The it original had Midway in it, didn't it? Um, oh. And it went out 100 miles? That's, that's right. a good question. Really cool um, oh, I think you're depth. right. Yeah, yeah. It was expanded. Out, yeah, that's right. Outward. And it was the original was more around the islands. Yeah, because it's actually, yeah, um, right. Midway is actually, Kuai Heleni is part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Yeah. So it has is, a longer... Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of um, existence under the federal system. Wow, look at that. Yeah. This is impressive what we're seeing here. Yes. We haven't seen this density, Empire, I don't uh -huh. think, anywhere. Yeah. yeah, definitely the highest density coral community you've seen on the seamount so far. They're definitely utilizing their space as much as they can, which is really cool. But it doesn't look like the density has adversely impacted the health of the, them. Yeah, it looks like they're all still relatively healthy. Um, Scott also notices, noticed, noted that he saw three different species of bamboo coral so far around here, and it was kind of interspersed, which are these kind of like acute angled corals that we're looking at, some fan-shaped bamboos, and then some sparse branching bamboos. Wow. Thanks, Scott. So last time I sailed with Scott, we were on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. 
making a trip to the Azores. What were you guys doing out there? Uh, that was on the Okeanos Explorer, um, and yeah, just exploring the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and we were partnering closely with a lot of the scientists that work in the Azores, and um, characterizing a lot of the deep sea coral and sponge habitats all along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And our focus was really on looking at some of the off-axis, so off the main spreading center. Uh, there's very impressive, rich features running along, sort of parallel to it. I've lost you, Jake. And sea mounts. I know, I, I was pulling to get a closer look at that coral abundance. Yeah. So most research, is, most research has been done on the actual spreading centers, but not on the adjacent uh, ridges and habitat. Was, is it frozen? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would love to visit the mid is he heading ocean, here too? mid okay. ocean ridge. Hannah, have you seen any of the uh, ROV footage of uh, deep sea hydrothermal vents? I haven't seen Nautilus footage, but I have seen footage in general. Yeah, I think we have to pretty remarkable. It again. My yes. first um, tr uh, leg aboard the Nautilus was looking at the Von Dam hydrothermal vents in the Caymans, which were really cool. It was amazing to see just clouds of blind alvinocarid shrimp just engulfing these hydrothermal vents. And the hydrothermal vents, instead of it being a typical black smoker, had clear, shimmering um, fluids instead, which is really unique of hydrothermal vents. They kind of gave like this huge cloud of very, of, of anemones, a beautiful shimmery look. It was quite an experience. Temporarily back. I'd like to find bottom before we reset the, the yeah. software. You can see we fell off that ridge about by about 20 meters. Or Atlanta did. Uh, which direction do you want to go to get back to it? Oh, let's look at the sonar. Southwest. Let's go, yeah, south. I am craving yeah, a that's sweet so tea. Craving yeah, a sweet tea. Good. I feel like you're just gonna drink a gallon as soon as you're off this boat. Oh, I already have, yeah, I have a gallon already stocked in my fridge for when I go back. I get my sweet tea fridge from now. Canes. Yeah. In uh, pre-COVID days. Can we please do a ship move, 25 meters, bearing 230? We would return to the beautiful University of Hawaii Thank Marine you. facility on the Nimitz Highway. Um, we would race over to a lovely establishment in Nico's. And everybody ordered salads. Yeah, that place is great. Good yeah. food. Yeah. Wait, what place? Nikos. It's Nikos. like on the pier right next to us. Uh, I'm looking it up. Yeah, it's over by Pop Marine. Nikos. I've seen it. I've never eaten there, oh, though. Oh, yeah, man. Upstairs, your fine dining. Oh, good food. Oh, it looks so beautiful. Okay, so it looks like we re-found re the ridge. We have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We gotta figure this out. It's that ram issue. Yeah. Something's hogging. I think it's the DVL track. Yeah. Can we shorten it? It doesn't need to be as long as it is. 
think there's like a, a number of points for it, yeah. Is that something Matt's aware of? Is oh, no. oh, Matt aware of that? I, uh, I'm not sure. Is Renny, I don't know if Renny's brought that right. up. Well, check on it. Yeah. No, he's sleeping. I believe. I can bring it up to Matt tomorrow. And yeah. Uh, he's probably up watching the sunrise. He likes the sunrise. Yes, yeah, he's up for breakfast. Yeah, he's aware of this issue. Oh, yeah. Okay. One of the challenges with a system like this that's permanently attached to a vessel is we operate from March to December. So there's no real time to just dig in and do a bunch of changes. We have to do those on the fly. Constant development. Are those the anemones on the... Looks like I believe so. Uh, uh, Some of the orange and enemy associates. Gotta try meowing at the sea log again. All right, Sako, enjoy your map nap. Where's that scientist Thanks at? for always being there, Sako. Are you guys okay with lat long here for now? Because if, if I reset it now, it's going to do the... Yeah, for now, it's all right. I, I don't even look at that, really. The Alvin XY origin thing makes it... <laughs> This coral community just continues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the end. Can we actually get a zoom on the lower ones with the little bit weirder branching? Like here? Yes. Sure, come down. You can see the ones above are the one the more um, uh, acute angled corals that Scott was mentioning. You can see one kind of in the middle by itself is the more um, regular internodal branching that we saw, that we don't really see on corals. I'm curious about these a little bit more, because these don't seem like they are sparse branching, but they aren't quite like the others. All of a sudden, it just got freezing cold. Yeah, it feels colder in here than, than right, usual. Zoom. I mean, it's, I get it, but all <laughs> of a sudden. Sorry. Um, I'm not seeing that on the graphs, the each back change. Yeah, that's a very tight focus. What? Talk in the background. Oh. Is that what you're looking for, Sebastian? Uh, yeah. I got a ni couple nice shots. Thank you. Sure. There's a base, too. Still partial. Sebastian, with with these oh, no. corals, they seem like the closer they get to the um, area they're connected to the um, basalt, they seem to be more bare versus when they're further out. Is that like signs of um, they're dying or? Um, for a lot of these, I think it might be just a morphological feature. Um, it could be a, a feature of some type of wasting, maybe, but uh, that would be more a Sako or Scott's um, ball field. 
But to me, it seems like this seems to be more of a morphological feature. Maybe the polyps move up as they grow out. Mm. Um, but yeah, some of them definitely look more uh, living than the others. Maybe like the ones up top that look kind of all yellow and bare are unhealthy or dead. It's so, probably like a tree where the newer growth is more towards the outside where the leaves are. So it, the, they want the polyps out in the as much into the water column as like they can. Exactly, especially if there's high density neighbors, uh, they may want to be kind of like trying to push themselves out to get as much as they can. Mm. Corals, some, some shallow water corals do this as well. That's so cool. Yeah, this guy, this does remind me of like a, almost like a desert bush, but underwater in a way. You know what I'm saying? I want to say yes, but like Tumbleweed? I, yeah. A little bit tumbleweedy before they become tumbly. Okay. Yeah. I see that. I'm looking at the sponges that are just up on my screen right now. Uh, the ferrets? Yeah, and it, it freaks me out because like, the stalk looks like it could be a, a vertebrae backbone. Oh, Rich yeah. Nav. Well, like certain structures happen multiple times in nature for a reason. Usually they're more stable or more structurally sound. Yeah, it's just crazy to see. When I think we saw a dead one yesterday and I literally thought it was like vertebrae. Yeah, a vertebrae. But what? you know, you still saw like the top part of it, but this the stalk looked Looks like a vertebrae backbone. It's a nice view in the uh, Atlanta cam right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It shows you how dense it looks. It's impressive. Yeah, when I see these um, like uh, deep water species, I kind of like my mind goes straight to like, oh, what is its counterpart on land? Like doing a comparison between what I know on the terrestrial kind of landscapes. There's a proper Hawaiian term for that, yes? Um, well, it's part of the Kumulipo, actually, that you have these partnerships and relationships between um, things that are growing organisms in the ocean and then organisms on land so they could reflect life cycles or like physical characteristics but they're like partner species and when one does well in the ocean the other one does well on land hmm. if there's problems with either one of them it's kind of reflected in their partner so it's really interesting this this kind of um partnership and relationships they're kind of like spiritual counterparts yeah spiritual and physical as well it's uh, interesting to me that in the Kumulipo in your in the uh, oral history that life started with the first coral polyp mm -hmm. and if you think about it that's a unique choice because that wouldn't be something that was readily encountered by people at that time. You know what I mean? They sunrise, sunset, rain, fish, harvest. Uh, but this, that life to start here with the uh, coral polyp. Uh huh. And if you yeah. think of some of them, they're not even discernible to the human eye. Right. Right.
just saw a very tiny jelly go by yeah. that kind of looked like one of our target species, but we were never going to get it anyways. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how uh, one would get a, a sample jelly with an ROV anyway. Usually you'd have this very special apparatus yeah. attached to get it. And even then, that one was going too small and going way too fast for us to ever catch up with it. Yeah. I know, I keep thinking the shrimp is bad. Just imagine a jellyfish. Yeah, which doesn't land anywhere. Yeah. That it's, is super fragile, so it's easy to damage. Yeah, also that. It's interesting, we have uh, several colleagues who have spent a good amount of their academic and professional time developing tools to recover samples or to interact with the uh, deep sea environment uh, without harming something. And they're usually leveraging methods that other organisms are using. So they're looking at how like octopus grasp things and trying to emulate that with modern hardware and technology. Bio-inspired biomimicry. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, and uh, soft grips that kind of uh, envelop something like an anemone would. I think we have some coral predation going on here. Yep, yep. Uh, orange sea star eating some bamboo, it looks like. I mean, he has the pick up the litter. Uh -oh. Where he wants Doesn't to eat. Any problem. <laughs> I believe it's goniasterid. Is that just hanging on there? Or it looks Garnet. like it. <laughs> it's so funny. I believe what was the word you used for when on. something had <laughs> stuffed itself? <laughs> that's for precarious. something that's what? That had eaten too much. Small anemone. Something that has eaten too much? Yeah. Like engorged itself. Engorged. Momona? Momona. Or <laughs> I think that was it. Like you, you, <laughs> Momona, you like have a big fat plate lunch. And and yeah. Then you're, yeah. That's a good term for this starfish. Or sea star. Kanaka tak. <laughs> <laughs> and then it looks like there's some kind of small um, coral or anemone right there on the rock as well. This Large individual polyp. Into this yeah. Interesting to watch over time because how's it going to transfer over. from that branch to the other one? Well, you just probably just let go and fall another one with how de high density it is. Huh. Yeah, Scott's saying this is a great place for a sea star to live. Tons of food. Yeah. There we're seeing that again, where the base doesn't seem to have active polyps, but the far ends do. Like uh, Mike was saying, you see on a tall tree in a forest. Yeah. Are we causing those corals to float, or is that just... We might just be stirring them up from the bottom with our thruster. Uh. I will note that that coral branch does look different from the other corals, so that's why I'm curious. Okay. Yeah, but we're not really hovering over or against anything, so yeah, it could, it's probably just the down thrust yeah. on something on the bottom. Yeah, oh, just, I'm, I'm already like, seeing uh, just a piece that's not attached to anything, so it could have just came up. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of um, uh, skeleton droppage around here, due to high density, how high density it is, and it's the fact that they have like abandoned density. branches as they move out. Bridge nav. Could you please do 25 meters at 190. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. What's that off the coral? The gray thing? Yeah, I see it. Ooh, I don't know. Right of oh, wait, it might be attached to the rock. It is. It is. It might be some kind of dead sponge, maybe. Maybe I a dead Valteria. So these corals in the deep sea seem much more um, I don't know if the word fragile um, than the 
the corals that I'm familiar with, which are really hard and stony-like, these seem very softer or... More brittle. More brittle, more, yeah, they seem just um, very different. In that they flow in the current, they move? They flow in the yeah. current, yeah. They just have that quality to them. It's more. It's a much more important adaptation than saying hard in this area type of, in the deep sea because they're relying more on these currents and they want to maximize their current gathering abilities. So being hard doesn't necessarily help with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they're able to move, they're probably if the current changes, they're still able to survive. Interesting theory. Which is a great adaptation. Yeah, the shallow water corals are the reef building ones that kind of like, you know, actually create land for themselves. These, um, these really just build the skeletons out into the water column because they're they're going after different things. These are going out for as filter feeders. Um, the corals, I mean, the corals in the in shallow water do that as well, but they also have the symbiotic algae. Right. Zo yeah, they're so they trying to, to build themselves sunlight. up as much as possible, yeah. and by building those layers of calcium carbonate they get closer to the light or help keep them up in the light in certain mm. cases if like you're on a sinking at all. They're kind of like condos, yeah? They kind of like have levels of them and then they're home for so many different organisms and they work together as family. It's very interesting. Yeah, Scott says the corals in shallow water you're thinking of are Scalarectinian corals in the Hexacoralia, and they are capable of producing massive skeletons with the help of symbiotic algae. These are these ones that we're looking at are octocorals with internal axial skeletons. Are you at the end of your tether? I'm just trying to work, work, work the way back. Looks like we've got two eels here. Oh, where? One just went off screen and one's here. Oh, just blending in. There it is. One of the really interesting adaptation I saw recently, I came across a spider in our camping gear that uh, used the Seek app from iNaturalist where you just take a photo and it tells you what it is. And it identified it as a false black widow. Hmm. Uh, so what an interesting adaptation to adapt the look of another thing that you avoid. Sound like something you want in your camping gear just in case your ID is wrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, he's coming up to challenge us. <laughs> nope. Okay. Uh -huh. well. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> Where did he? Oh, there he is. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sebastian, do these um, deep water eels kind of have that same type of jaw structure that the shallow water ones have? Yes, they still have jaws. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. <laughs> just, uh, they may have um, a little bit more flexibility to their jaws, allowing them to swallow a larger prey at once, because in the deep sea you may not know when your next meal is, so they try to eat as much <laughs> as they can. But yes, they still have jaws. I think somebody likes us. Uh, do they have the teeth that go backwards? Um, some species do, for sure, because some of them will try and trap their prey and ensure that they don't escape and having those backwards facing teeth, inwards facing teeth, can really help with that. That was, that was aggressive. <laughs> yeah, those shallow water eels always look aggressive just because they're opening their mouth to bring the water in. Yeah, you ever see anybody get bitten by an eel? Uh -oh. Oh. No, I've seen Have you? Oh, gosh. I've yeah. It doesn't sound fun at all. <laughs> wow. I've got to it Because you do not yeah, want to pull that nasty. off of yeah, you. Yeah, they're pretty nasty. Yeah, they have, a, yeah. They have um, fragile jaws, a secondary set of jaws inside of them <gasps> that they use to grab and pull it deeper in. Oh, like Alien. Oh. Great. Yeah, it's literally uh -huh. one of the inspirations for Alien. We, um, we filmed an eel predating a fish and uh, not only does it do that but once it grabbed it it wrapped its body around it and then tightened and uh, 
uh, it was audible, that, that activity. Hard to. Yeah, that is painful. So, I wonder if there's something about having all these corals here that makes it a environment well suited for the eels. Well, these high density coral communities are typically associated with a lot of um, other organismal activity. Mm -hmm. So many of the small fish that we would probably normally see here are probably being scared off by the ROV. But these guys are a little bit less scared of us, it seems, but are still kind of prowling the area for potential prey, even though the prey is probably avoiding us. What do you think the apex predator here is? Oh, still sharks. As it is in um, Papahanaumokuakea, the apex predators, are the mano, the shark, and the ulua, or the uh, trevallis, they are the top predators um, that you don't really see down in the um, occupied Hawaiian islands. It is a definite apex predator reef system. I assume these guys, though, are still pretty high on the food chain. Not the top, but pretty up there. Bridge nap. Please do 25 meter move at bearing 175. Thank you. Oh, is he coming back around here? Yeah. I'd say that he's oh, well. well aware of our presence and not too yeah. thrilled with it. I think he's territorial. Yeah, I think so. This is probably his p p dense patch of coral. She might be. Or they. Let's oh, yeah. not assume the gender of this snap rank. No, we will not want to do that. Uh, yeah, and it's about 1.8 degrees Celsius here, so normally an organism would be pretty conservative in its movements. So Scott's noting that these um, branched bamboo corals that they haven't just fully described yet have all been seen in these super, super dense patches. So this is a normal physiology, huh. habitat building sense for them. <laughs> Hannah and I are making the same face as she's looking at pictures of the eels in her jaws. We're both like, nope, <laughs> stay away. Uh -uh. That is really... Ugh. I never even thought to look up. I didn't even know that. Oh, That's and they're so prevalent. So when I grew up in Hilo, yeah. we don't really have like a lot of sandy beaches. It's mostly like basalt. Yeah. And so there's so many puhi eels there. So, I mean, we would see them all the time. And we learn not to stick your hand or your face in pukas or holes. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> because that's where they're hanging out. So, um, yeah, I have seen a lot of people get bit by oh, eels. Awful. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense about the beaches because that, that's still the, uh, the youngest, that's the youngest of the, of the islands. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That hasn't had the wave action to make the sand yet. Hilo's on the north side of, of the big island? Eastern. Eastern? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's one of the islands I haven't been to yet. Oh, man. But I've so seen it from Mount there. Haleakala. Oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. You that got to see Mauna Kea, I bet. Sponge. Yeah. Not this little, like, there's a yellow one right below, possibly. This guy? Yeah. And, uh, no offense to your doctoral research, Mike, but uh, I think my favorite dive, scuba dive, was uh, the pelagic dive off the big island. Was that over on the Kona side? Yeah. Yeah, you go uh, out at night, a couple miles out off the shelf, and 
hook a night time, hook a parachute up to the bow so you're floating with the current, and put weighted lines in about 40 feet deep, and go down and look at all the pelagic life coming up to feed. And uh, it really changes how you see the ocean. It clearly almost becomes like you realize there's almost more life than there is water. There's so many organisms in, in that water column. It's amazing. Yeah, that's one of the most popular uh, fishing destinations, the Kona Coast. Mm. And the water is just so gorgeous. There's also a lot of upwelling that occurs there off the coastline, over on Keahole side. So they have like the science and technology, I forget what it's called. It's an like an industrial ET. park. Yeah, these look like ET sponges to yes. me. I was going to say that, but... It's so interesting how... Uh, Too bad Tari isn't in here. We'll have to capture, capture an image for her. The, uh, each island has such a distinctly unique feel about it. Uh, yeah, they in, really do. In almost every respect. Over you. Are there in, uh, uh, is it Oli Hawaii? What's the term for the Hawaiian language? Olelo Hawaii. Olele. Olelo, Olelo Hawaii. Hawaii. Um, are there accents, like regional or island-specific accents that have been detected? Do you know? Um, there are, like, different islands yeah. can say things in different ways. Right. Um, yeah, so it would be regionalized. So more like maybe dia dialect yeah. differences. Yeah. But literally, you could, you know, the language is so similar that those differences will be very minor. Right. So this one looks like the curious ET with its head canted to the side, and the one on the right is a much more serious ET. Oh, I love this. I come back and we're looking at two. Are these ET sponges? <laughs> Pretty sure. <laughs> I'm double checking because Scott has put a scientific name in the chat. Okay. Oh, I love them. Oh, that sediment looks very different right there. Yes, ET sponges. Yay. They're called Advena, no, Ad, Advena Magnifica. Uh, Magnifica. Oh. Advena is from the Latin Advena, which means alien, but in the sense of a visitor, a foreigner, or an immigrant. Huh. And these, can we get a zoom on these? I think these are bamboos, but I want to double check. Yeah, they look, because uh, we're kind of like, looks like we're kind of approaching the edge of that yep. bamboo reef. Bamboo for sure. Get a zoom. Zoom in, zoom in down on this one is probably the better. Yep, definitely bamboo. Bamboo fans becoming more prevalent. Yep, thank you. During the interaction, I saw, was that an eel? Mm -hmm. yeah. it, was that the same eel hanging out like the whole time or was that? Yeah, it yeah. was very territorial, territorial and oh. not happy we were there. It's like, oh. get out of my space. Here's a big rock. Hannah, can we collect Boulder. this one? Um, <laughs> I don't know, it's too small. Too small. Too small. The sponge here survived. So these guys appear to be a different species of bamboo, according to Scott. The bamboo diversity. I still can't get over diversity. <laughs> that was so I wanna, funny. I wanted to visit there. Can we get a zoom on please some of the top, please? Please diversity. Diversity. I've literally never heard of that before. Oh, is that Sebastian just to zoom on any one of these? I yes, please. Of the ones that are bending. <laughs> I really thought it was a real city, too. 
Like, I really did. Should be. Bridge nap. That was so funny. All stop, please. Oh, we don't We don't need an all stop. We just need a zoom. We're not collecting. Go yeah, through. I just need to reorient zoom. where we're going. All right. First just cool making sure you don't stop it for me. Thanks. Uh, fish in the back right. Corneal. Back Small over crinoid. There. Anemone. And brighten that up a bit. Do you need the base or is this good? All right, come on. Come on out. Sorry. Let me get back Sorry. in. Yep. Front so we can get in the box. Figure out what we're, where we're going, what we're doing. So, Malia, uh, I think if I remember the numbers wow. correctly, you said there were 30,000 people who are uh, speak Hawaiian and I think 6,000 children in Yep. The schools uh -huh. um, currently yes and is that trend moving upward if, if you look at it over time are those numbers increasing oh absolutely when you think back into the 1970s there were less than 50 children that could um, South. speak Olelo Hawaii yeah southwest south southwest uh, I don't we don't want to go out there we want to go this way southeast southeast ish this way. Yeah. What are you at? One five five. Um. Tito's heading right now. And three one. About the same. Three five. Atlantis is one three five. Sonar target showing the rise off to the north. Are these sheet flows, Hannah? Maybe we should Looks just go like due it, east then. But I don't know. I think. I see a lot of pebble fragment, rock fragments. We don't want to go up north again. <laughs> That's where we came from. We're supposed to be moving it's this way. I can't tell if it's a sheet flow or a low bait flow. I can't tell. I'll just say flow to the so west. I've got nothing on the sonar to the north. Excuse me, to the east. To the, to the east. Is it the east? So it seems like south is where to go. So right. we came from the north. We yeah, we want to do, go that way anyway. Let's so. do 170. Yeah. Uh, how big a move you think? Um, start with 20. Yeah, let's start with 20. So, Malia, if you went off island for a holiday, although I, th I think maybe you said you had relatives in Idaho, uh, do you have a favorite spot you like to? go to if you leave the island? Um, oh, huh, that's a great question. If possible? Sure. I do love Idaho. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Just the, the access to the environment to. is pretty incredible. Going in. Holding. Oh, that's pretty. Pretty. Uh, send that to Dougal Lindsay at Jamstack. What? Polola? Pololia. Pololia. It has a little tip to it, like a little, like almost like a baby ball tip. Mm. Pololia. So yeah, we were talking earlier about um, Olelo Hawaii and the uh -huh. resurgence of the language. So in the 1970s, there were less than 50 children that could speak Olelo Hawaii. And over the last 50 years, that's increased, you know, to over 30,000 language speakers. So yes, um, you know, that's going to continue as more people and more children 
are learning their mother tongue, um, Olelo Ma Kuahine, our mother language. And um, that's exciting because, as we know, culture is embedded in language. You cannot have culture without language. And so um, that normalization is happening. So there's been a reignition, and then now it's becoming very normal to hear Hawaiian language, where 10 years ago it was like not. Yeah, it's so interesting that, um, you know, it's it's chicken and the egg what which came first but there was um those events in the 70s and 80s that you know there was very strong uh individual hawaiian personalities combined at the same time with some threats to some really sacred areas that just seemed to i don't know be uh the start of you know kind of uh more Hawaiian-centric thinking and appreciation of culture, maybe, is a way to say it. Yeah, and I think, too, it was also a um, reframing of history. That's a better word. Um, because of the colonial system that Hawaiians are under, the story of our history was never told. And it took Hawaiians, Kanaka O'ivi, going up to Washington to the National Archives and digging through that, researching um, our history, that the real story of Hawaii's occupation has been told. And yeah, if you think about what you learned uh, in your early years of schooling about the kingdom and uh, what your grandkids learn, it's changed quite a bit. Oh, hugely, because we never learned about our history right. in the Department of Education. We heard about the Treaty of Annexation, which doesn't exist. There's no such thing. <laughs> Our history was fabricated. So now that we, we understand what our true history is, that, you know, the truth will set you free. Who's the brilliant person <laughs> who said that? <laughs> So, Hannah, when are we looking to collect the next Pohaku? Ooh. Where was the last one collected? Um, uh, let me see. At um, 12.07, so about three hours ago, at a depth of 21, 22 meters. 22 meters. 21, 22 meters, yeah. 2,122. Yes. So they collected between wave point four and wave point five. Oh, wow. Oh, we do? Hold up. Let me double check, because there's no way that it's been that long. Bridge, Nev. Yeah, because it was sample 99. It was the last time before we took the Please mission. track a line bearing 170 at 0 0.29. Between waypoint wow. 6 and waypoint 7. It's got to be, it had to be before either between waypoint 5 and waypoint 6 or waypoint 6 and waypoint 7. I think we could probably collect it before, I don't know if we should wait till before 9 or on our way to 10. I don't know. Your call. Are maybe, they maybe before 9? Sorry, Tori, what did you say? No, that's okay. Um, are these still the polyopagon sponges? Yeah, these these are poly, I got correct in how, on the pronunciation, polyopogons. Polyopogons. 
very curious about the big fan in the back, though. Oh. Hannah, are you trying to take a rock from like a flatter area or on the slope? We're trying to take rocks from on the slope because Dr. Val is hoping that it won't be a hyaloclastite. Are we waiting for boat movement? Nope, we're tracking the line right now. Oh, okay. Anyway, we can zoom on the big fan in the back over here on the right. Try. I actually, Tori, yesterday, um, my high school that I did the ship here. to shore with, mm -hmm. they made an article about the not like our ship to shore. Really? Yeah. Oh, with you and Catalina? Yes. That's nice. And I didn't realize that my teacher, my old teacher, she was like, oh my yet. goodness, like, no, don't are all we can talk about. Da, da, da. Yeah, you're kind of, and she was like, know, I was you're off to the right from Atlanta. Right? Yep. Copy. She was like, I was watching the live stream with my class the other day and you were on and you y'all were looking at acorn worms yeah. and I looked it up you for my class and yeah, we were sure. talking Real about quick. it. And I was Holding just like, air. this is so Definitely crazy. Definitely right. a pair of right. There you go. Thank you. It's funny, from this angle, it almost has a bonsai look. Or a corral day, okay. I could see that. Um, Scott, um, Kind of new be the corals here. Anyway, you can explain the difference between Coralidae's and Hemicorallium versus um, Paragorgia. Yeah, but so I sent the the article to my parents, and they were like, "Oh my gosh, this is so cool!" And uh, I was like, "I couldn't believe it." I, I know they were so it. proud of you to get that. Send it to me. I want to read it. I uh, okay. I really have uh, sympathy for your parents, coworkers, neighbors, friends, the grocery clerk. I'm sure they're telling everybody. No, 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 oh. you just got in all this line. Um, can we also get a zoom on this rock up here of the yellowish feature to it? Yep. Go zoom. 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 Okay, it looks like it's just a bunch of small barnacles. Do we know how the width of the laser dot itself? That would be a fantastic question. Does it change with distance? Okay, I sent the link to you on your... Nice. Center. Hannah, I'm sure you and Catalina inspired like a young generation of young yeah. women, you know, to enter the STEM field or, That's, yeah. That is actually like one of the questions we were asked was like, how has it been like being a woman in STEM? And especially, I don't know how it is for geographers, for Catalina, but for geology, it is definitely a male dominated field. And just, it's just, um, it was really cool to like talk to, because yeah, I went to an all-girls school for context, and we really, they pushed us towards, well, it was called STREAM, which is science, technology, re religion, I went to a Catholic school, religion, engineering, arts, and mathematics, and I, my teachers, my science teachers at Dominican truly inspired me, and made me feel like I could accomplish anything in science. And so being able to reach out back to them and thank them in this way was so special to me. And I know it was also special for Catalina. And I was just so excited to yeah, see young girls also be super excited about doing science mm -hmm. and like being a part of the conversation because a lot of the times you can, or at least for me, it feels like I shouldn't, um, I don't know, it's hard, like imposter syndrome is just yeah. so 
real. I feel like everybody has it. Everybody. So, yeah, I was just making sure they knew that, yeah, they're not alone. And then also saying, like, that Dominican does prepare them for college. I was like, you may not like what they're, like, your homework now, but you'll, you'll appreciate, you'll actually, like, appreciate it later. But, yeah, it was really nice talking to them. Awesome. I'm sure you inspired many of those young ladies. Yeah. And Sounds that's like what they need, cool role models. To give mm -hmm. back to. So if any of them just do anything, there. so I was t we were talking to the biotech club. So, I, yeah, I was a part of that club. And it was really fun. We got to, like, take our DNA sample and put it on a necklace. It was really, really cool. And... So the moderator for that club is Miss Koenig, and that was my Bio 2 teacher. And also my Bio 1 teacher was there, my physics teacher was there, me and Catalina's soccer coach was there. Cool. Yeah, and the, <laughs> and the president of the school was there, which I didn't know until I looked at the, um, the article. And I was like, I was talking to the, the president. I was kind of sh like shook. Like I was like, whoa. Maybe I should have been more formal than I was because I tried to have just like co like normal conversations with them. Which I'm sure the students appreciate it. Yeah, I think that, that, yeah. That, that, that's, that's the right tone. Yeah. 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 Being authentic and just being yourself, that goes yeah, exactly. so far, especially with, you know, youth that are looking at you and like, you know, seeing themselves in you. Like they want to see Hannah and oh, hear about, you know, all of your experiences. And I appreciate you speaking on imposter syndrome a little bit and just oh, recognizing yeah. that like you know it's really an issue for, I, uh, for me i was even talking recently to amber our lead video engineer and telling her and i tell all of our interns this too i believe that lack of confidence is a tremendous asset that if you are not absolutely positively sure that you know everything you take your time and you're careful and you rethink your decisions and uh, you just uh, end up not making ginormous mistakes based because of overconfidence. Um, and so that, you know, it might be called imposter syndrome, but, uh, you know, talking through things, questioning, having somebody check you on something, those are all really strong traits that do well in my field. Uh, so uh, I don't... I don't think that's a bad thing to have. And that's such a new term, imposter syndrome. Like, that was not even a thing 10 years ago. So I'm just, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that all means. I think they're, <laughs> I think they're trying to encapsulate a feeling of not belonging and using a word that is, you know, somebody who doesn't belong trying to fit in. I, I'm not sure it's the, the right, but right, yeah. best choice, but is it's... That does that definition ring true? So I think when I see a lot of people kind of expressing that that's something that they're feeling, it's more so that, like, they're looking around the room and noticing all these people with, like, maybe, uh, specifically when we're talking about, like, careers, um, just trying to figure out, like, how did I get here? Like, mm. am I supposed to be here in this yes. spot? And, like, a lot of doubt and, like, your own capabilities. <laughs> um, yes. And I think that's for a lot of people when they say that's maybe what they're feeling, like, you know, that that's what they mean. But, um, yeah, so, and even the advice that I gave to the students, I was like, I also need to start taking my own advice. I was like, I, I'm not really practicing what I preach. And, like, I noticed that about myself, and I'm like, I, I'm trying to just undo it. I don't know. Do you think this has kind of sprung up from the social media because you're always having people like judging you? No. Uh, I, I have a theory. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. For social media, I think um, a lot of that self-doubt comes from the fact that a lot of social media posts ideals opposed to reality. Mm. So you see a lot of these social media posts with people like doing these amazing things having great life, doing etc. And that gives you a sense of self-doubt, like, oh, my life should be like that. But in reality, often or not, their lives are much more similar to your own. And they're just posting the very best bits of themselves to make themselves look better to everybody else. It's kind of like the new version of fashion magazines. 
you know, you don't see it on a newsstand anymore. You see it on, on your phone, but it's still giving a false, you know, something that's not true about, like a like the glossed over to make it look perfect. That's an interesting point. I hadn't heard of that, thought of that before. If uh, if you think about in, in terms of academia and uh, professional career for the young professionals that come out into an environment like this, it's an amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. But they're surrounded by people, you know, like Mike is, you know, has a doctorate and is working for one of the eminent maritime archaeology firms uh, in the country, if not the world. And so it's easy to be intimidated and feel like you don't belong around somebody like that, I think, because I see it a lot in the young professionals that come out. And uh, I uh, have half a lecture on this topic, but... Uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's a real thing that young professionals, young academics, certainly feel. Um, Scott France also posted in the chat about his experience of it. He says, "I've been working in the field of deep sea biology since the late '80s, and I still experience imposter syndrome in situations. Yeah. But I've learned that it's okay not to know everything, and it encourages me to ask questions. I learn more that way rather than pretending I know." Hmm. That's really important, Scott. I really appreciate you mentioning that and Sebastian that you read it out loud because I think that's something that it benefits our viewers to hear too. Just that, like, uh, one, we're in this space together working collaboratively because we learn from each other here. Like, we're not coming here already just like knowledgeable about every single thing. Like, we're here, we're learning, and that's part of this process. And um, that's really important. No, it was really one of the reasons why I was so intimidated to come on this boat was because I was so worried that I didn't know everything about oh. anything. Oh, well, not anything, but, like, <laughs> about these seamounts. And I'm like, well, you, they've never seen them before, so how are you supposed to know what is going to show up? How are you supposed to predict that and be exactly. ready for it? That, that's, yeah. like, the core of a career, though, is you don't have... You're not going to know everything, but you trust. It's almost like jazz. You trust that you have this core skill set to get you through a situation, even though you don't know what the situation is going to be. Um, that and I think that's important, like to be vulnerable um, and to admit mm -hmm. that you don't know something, which I really appreciate, you know, because we are on a journey of lifelong learning. So I like when people say, I don't know, but I can find out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really me. I think that's a really great quality of a scientist is being able to admit that you don't know something. Yeah. And that you, the world is unknown. We, we don't always know everything. And that's our goal as scientists is to help bridge that gap and find out. Mm -hmm. So not knowing something is just opportunity in that yeah. sense. Yeah, and that can be really exciting. Um, what are some other maybe qualities or characteristics that we think are important for this work or being able to come out here and like be successful? Uh, Curiosity. Uh, yeah, I think there's, you know, and this is part of the, you know, what Dr. Ballard wanted to do when he started all this was that, you, you know, we don't, he, he wanted pe pe uh, scientists who were supportive of this, who were late in their careers. He, he didn't want the ones who were like, oh, mine, 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 I want, I want this because I'm, you know, academics is very, um, you know, it's very competitive and, and everyone's trying to get a, get grants and fund themselves and fund their students, you know, and Bob wanted the, the, the scientists who are established in their fields or, or closer to retirement who weren't, who, who were just going to be able to sit back and, and let others, um, you know, let students figure stuff out and, and come out here really as a, as a support network um, for, for the entire community and, and actually like actually represent a community like you know I don't need this sample but the community could benefit from it because it's it's new or it's unique or that sort of thing um, and so it, it was a really interesting paradigm that that started that the, the advisory board was made up of, of people who who were interested in, in spending their time working for either on board Nautilus or or from shore and being scientists on shore who did not have skin in the game for getting a publication or grant for themselves. It was about supporting, you know, the entire scientific community in oceanography and ocean exploration as a whole. And that has, has since trickled down 
you know, to a whole, uh, I think, generation of young scientists. I mean, you know, Val's a postdoc, and, and she's great, you know, and, and a, you know, she's going to get some, some stuff out of this. But, but overall, we're, you know, she and I are lead scientists for uh, documenting stuff that, um, you know, is, is important the for the whole community. Sponge? Um, and there's been a lot of other I younger... I think it's a sponge, possibly a dead one. Okay, thank you. Uh, lead scientists um, in the same way. But I think that, you know, the, the intent behind uh, Ocean Exploration Trust has, has always been to uh, start exploring and, and have the scientific community um, do it at, for, for a larger purpose than, than individual research goals. That is so refreshing. Do you know any other entity that is doing that type of um, exploration or research? I mean, yeah, the only other one is really um, NOAA through, through the Okinawa Explorer Program. It's it's very, OET and, and NOAA o Ocean Exploration are very, they work hand in hand in that regard. Um, but typically, you know, that is not the, sign, the, the NSF style um, of research. So it, it really was, starting to change the paradigm of how science and exploration is done. Although federally funded projects are starting to ask that there be an outreach component included in the proposal. Um, so you're sharing your work with the public or engaging them in some manner, but not to the extent that we're doing it for so many months on end, nonstop. But yeah, I agree with that statement. Like it's it's definitely become expected that there's some sort of broader engagement beyond yeah. just like publishing a paper in your field. It's, I mean, to be honest, sometimes that feels kind of token, right? It's like, okay, yeah, we'll do this outreach and there's a minimal budget for it. Or, um, but I think it's definitely front and center and everything that the No Ocean Exploration and Ocean Exploration Trust are doing. Yeah. And I know it's a really important part of the Ocean Exploration um, Coll Collaborative Institute as well. So. Oh yeah, for sure. That that's like a like the next logical step from uh, kind of kind of even increasing uh, all of that. And I know even with um, White House initiatives and memorandums that have been issued under Biden, um, really that acknowledgement and elevation of indigenous knowledge and communities has been um, really something transformational um, when it comes to traditional ecological knowledge and the valuing of it by federal agencies. So I think, you know, Deb Halland um, with the Department of Interior, a Native American woman, um, you know, her leadership and guidance in making sure that traditional ecological knowledge is um, included in any kind of policies, um, management, um, especially of indigenous lands, is so important, you know, because that top-down approach and support is really needed by a lot of our indigenous um, tribes and communities who have been doing the work. They've been taking care of these places for millennium and being acknowledged and elevated in their conservation and stewardship can only benefit everybody. That was one randomly dense rock. Yeah. So another loaded question, Do you, have you felt that academia and science has been making adequate progress in terms of diversity? Great question. Um, uh, uh, I, I can tell you from my perspective as a 60 year old white male that the amount of effort being put in to into diversity and real effort into diversity and inclusion is orders of magnitude larger 
I can't speak to the results, um, uh, but I, I, I would like to think that there's an appreciation for how much stronger a team is when there's a diversity of backgrounds and representation in that team. It's not an answer to your question, but it has changed immensely over the course of my career, let alone the last decade, let alone the last two years. Uh, Thank you for the input. Yeah. I, uh, What do you think, Sebastian? Um, yeah. I think that there are great strides in many aspects of diversity being made. I'm seeing significantly more women, which is fantastic. Um, we are seeing more people of color arriving on the scene, so I'm myself included. Um, there's quite a few LGBTQ plus people in the sciences I've seen so far, including on this boat. Um, the only one that I can think of is more personal to me, and that is those from the disabled community. Great. Right. Um, so, um, I've actually done a lot of DEI sessions for uh, disabled, ac disabled scientists in academia, and generally there has not been a increase in disabled uh, PhD recipients since the passing of the ADA in the 1980s. It's been roughly the same amount every year since its passing, while all other minority groups have seen a marked increase in the number of PhD recipients. So I do think, in many ways, academia is progressing, but it's still leaving behind certain minority groups that are less um, visual, well, yeah, less noticed or less acknowledged in terms of um, DEI. So, so what would be, I'm, I, just from my perspective as an indigenous person, I know that we've had to um, really go toe-to-toe -to -toe in forcing, um, unfortunately, you know, that's what we've had to do in, in Hawaii, is to kind of force those conversations, to put ourselves in conflicted spaces, to put ourselves in these areas that were not accepted, um, so I'd hate to see, you know, other groups that are excluded have to go through that process again. I'm like, what have we learned so that people don't have to fight so hard to be included? I do definitely think that a big step is getting those um, minority groups into position, higher positions in the sciences and academia to help you know, bridge the gap and help have paved the way for future scientists of their group. Um, oh, it's up in the water column. Oh, sorry? I was just looking at this thing up in the water column. Oh, it's a, it's a sponge. It looks like a calophagus. Um, continuing my thought. Um, where is it? Yeah, we definitely need to see more um, minority scientists in positions of power but the nature of academia is that um, a lot of these older scientists from prior generations just establish roots mm -hmm. and become difficult to kind of move on. Mm -hmm. They don't want to move on and they want to keep on doing the research and be relevant, which I completely understand. But at the same time, without that upper momentum for a lot of these minority scientists, the field kind of comes to a halt in terms of upper movement for minority scientists. Yeah, I've seen that in the anthropology field as well. Um, in Hawaii, particularly. Um, so yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. The status quo. So Hannah, what about this change we're seeing here? It's like suddenly there's a bunch yeah. of larger items and it looks like they're either stopped or they're buried. So Val actually saw this kind of pebble field too and she didn't really have an explanation for it, so right. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but this isn't the first time we've seen it on the seamount. If you think about 
it. I mean, we're really just shining a very small flashlight on a ginormous feature. So it's going to take a lot of time to really understand the whole area. Yes, I just find it really interesting that it's on the incline and not like in the saddle area. Yeah, it's almost, I mean, kind of wish we could have that bigger picture of where it starts up and, and where it ends down. Like, is it a slide feature? Yes. Are these nuggets that we're looking at? Or are these just like pebbles? I think they're just pebbles. Just, again, rock fragments. Val wasn't seeing any nodules. So, cause a ton of high frequency noise. In Sebastian, the thank you for sharing that. Oh yeah, of course. I could go far more into it, but I do not want to go into a rant. I would like us to enjoy the science in front of us. Yes. <laughs> Mahalo, Sebastian. They look perfectly spaced. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like just like a single layer. I'm sure mm -hmm. that's not, but yeah, it looks like they were like intentionally placed there. Bridge nav. Could you please track a line bearing two zero zero at zero point three knots? Two zero zero point three. Opai ula. Opai, opai is shrimp. Um, ula is red. Oh. Opai ula. Opai ula. Opai ula. Opai ula. I think that's the first color that I've learned. I know, same. Why? Oh, that's the color red? Ula. Okay, ula. Okay. Um, oh, pie is shrimp. Ula is red. Ula ula is actually um, the colors we duplicate themselves. Um, so like yellow is mele mele. Green is oma oma o. So you notice they kind of like say that the word is um, reduplicated twice. Is there a reason for that? I think it's the emphasis a lot of times in the Hawaiian language. Um, like when you look at the um, black coral, kula mana mana, that the mana mana um, emphasizes the word. Yes. So when you have that doubleness, um, and I'm not no scholar, I'm sure there's other reasons why, but that's my um, observation, is that it increases the intensity, if that's a good word. There's a cool thing in uh, yeah, the Ukrainian language where you can repeat thing? yes or no for emphasis. So it's kind of missing. Can we zoom English, on this yellow thing, please? Yeah. Sorry. To you got you. that, Jake? Yeah. Yep. Going in. That yellow thing would be mele mele yellow. <laughs> mele mele. Mele mele. Camp. Camp. Oh, that's a camp. Uh, We've actually seen surprisingly it. little uh, yeah. anthropogenic very, very debris, little. which is nice to see. Mm -hmm. I know it's there. certainly in much bigger quantities elsewhere, but I'm glad that uh, it, we're not seeing it in, in large quantities. Looks to be like some kind of veggie camp. Is that still uh, its label on maybe it? Text yeah, on that's the label. Wow. On too. I think that's something that, that looks like it's a 70s or 80s can. That's not yep. a modern can. Yeah, I think if you look at the other end, you'd see the pull tab is off of it if it had one. We're close to land. 
we are closer to yeah. land and average for our typical expeditions. But certainly not close to a population center. Mm -hmm. Well, there probably were, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, supplies being brought out to Midway over the year, over the decades. So. Oh my gosh. I just finished the third book in that trilogy you recommended and the amount of times that the military just threw things overboard including like planes and ordinance yeah <laughs> just we have a trail yeah yeah, yeah. uh off of uh was it a lot off of honolulu some yeah. fishermen brought up a mustard gas canister we get it washed up along the waena coast along waimanalo where bellows air force Station uh, is there's a lot of ordinance that washes up live ordinance. What was the name of the book series, Ed? Uh, I don't know if the it uh, um, hold on, we got a look now. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have like a trilogy name, but it's yeah. it's just it's three books that chronicle the Pacific War or the the Mer the naval Pacific War um, by Ian Toll. Uh, the first one is Pacific Crucible. And they're they're just so readable, like um, yeah, it's Pacific he, he, Crucible, Conquering Tide, and Twilight of the Gods. He uh, he writes it like a story, um, and and focuses on different um, individuals during the war and tells it like through different anecdotes that way. And it's just you know you're you're understanding both sides of the uh, of yeah, the conflict like, through. And you just, it's just so readable. It's not Anglo-centric. Yeah. Uh. Like, he, he, he gets into, like, some of the history pre-1940s uh, that, that kind of documents why um, Japan started to feel pressured and going back into the late 1800s. Um, it kind of gives some context to that. And even, uh, have you read the third one yet? No, I haven't gotten to the third it one yet. It really goes into how that same type of uh, paralysis and uh, political situation led them to go so deep into the war even after they, it was clear there was no path to victory. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I need, I, I have it, I just need to, you know, read it. <laughs> Acquiring. the recommendation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. They were, they it's, were uh, really good reading. Yeah, and, and um, that was uh, the, the last two chapters of Pacific Crucible, the first book, is where he talks about Midway, and that was yeah. my, my first, other than, you know, when, when Ballard found Yorktown in 1998, uh, that was my first real reading of, of what happened, other than, like, cursory, you know, like, one or two sentence summaries of Midway, um, and so it's it's just, uh, yeah, really, really well researched and, and well written and, and accessible, it's not, it's not like sitting there reading a textbook. Yeah. I really enjoyed, there was a period where, it was almost single-handedly, I think it was the um, journalist Tom Brokaw, who really shined a light on the sacrifices made by an entire generation. Uh, oh yeah, the greatest generation? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was almost necessary because it kind of uh, came home and didn't want to talk about that part of their lives. And you think about everything they left behind. Yeah, my grandfather never talked to us about any of his experiences. Yeah. Who were the greatest generation? Who, wh who were they? Those young uh, men and women who stood up in service uh, in the Second World War uh, and left uh, the period of American isolationism to confront tyranny, fascism, and other forces. Huh. Yeah, my dad served in World War II in China. He was in Chongqing, which was like the capital of the American military headquarters. Yeah. But he often told the stories of those times and, and his experiences and flying over the hump. He called Himalaya. Um, they had to fly over from India over the Himalayan mountains to get to China. And yeah, I mean, his experiences exactly. were just yeah. really vivid for us. Well, it, that's, uh, it's lucky that you guys got to hear those stories from him because that, that that's actually the, the exception to the norm. Most 
uh, veterans who returned from the Second World War just, yeah, they kind of shut down about mm. it. It was much, much more commonly. My father was a POW during World War II. I guess a trauma, you know? Yeah, for I'm sure. sure that yeah. happened well, in they, well, Afghanistan. They, and they didn't want to, they didn't want to sort of, you know, tell the kids that because um, I think they might have been, they didn't, they were afraid that they didn't want to expose their kids to those sorts of well, um, horrors in a way. I don't think yeah. there was a recognition then of the pers the effect of that tra going through that trauma on the individual and yeah. tools to help them deal with it. And I think there's a lot more recognition of that expertise in it nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like that silent stoicism, right? You just right. don't speak about what yep. hurts. Well, I'm glad my dad was an exception to the rule. Yeah. Because we really learned a lot about yeah. what all occurred. But I think for your family, that was probably healthier, you know, because you understood him better. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, seeing another right, dramatic uh, change that here the from the pebble field. Mm -hmm. Oh, this thing? Yes. Uh, I'm going to go. Good. I'm going to go crinoid. crinoid. I think it's a. I can't tell from this far away, but I think maybe. Uh, I think I know what it is. Let's see if we can get. <laughs> I think I'm wrong. <laughs> this is a Brazingid. Ay, uh, yes. <laughs> flip flip a coin over here. Sorry, y'all. You can tell it's more fleshy. It doesn't yeah. have claspers. Less claspy. To me, the crinoids look almost like feathery. Not feathery, but like, I, they just have a lot of yeah. like... I look like I they look, have look like bony flowers. To yeah. Me. Well, these guys look like sea stars that are kind of like pushing themselves into a little bit of like a cup shape. Yeah, the Brzingid was on a low wave flow. <laughs> I thought that's what Sebastian was asking you originally. And then I was like, oh wait, no. It's Brzingid versus crinoid again. But good, we're learning. Getting better. Are you guys happy with the speed, or do you want to go a little bit faster? Um, we could go a little faster. Yeah. We haven't really been needing to. I, I know as soon as we pick up speed, we're going to need to. We're going to want to stop. <laughs> it's always what yeah. happens. Yeah. Well, let's but try. then again, that brings us to biology because they always have to stop. So I Bridge think increase the speed. Please track a line bearing 205 at 0 0.4 knots. Thank you. So Hannah, this pebble field that we're looking at, um, any ideas about like how this got here? Are these just rock fragments that like have been falling and then are resting here after being like broken apart even more? I think they may be from the initial eruption, some of them. Oh. I, like bits of magma just like falling and cooling quickly. That's, that's what I'm thinking. And also, I have seen, like, see this like massive like low bait flow just surrounded by it. It makes me believe that it could have come from another place but i think it's just too much for it to be just like debris fall i think it was i was like um it just happened quickly when it was cooling rapidly and fragments just fell but it's pretty evenly spaced too yes so uh while we're just kind of cruising along um yeah i'd like to discuss uh, where we're headed. Um, so after waypoint nine, we have a decision to make. Um, we can either head towards the original waypoint ten, but a little east of that, uh, kind of stay right along this Fish. ridge drop off. Yeah. Um, or we could head up towards this uh, sort of pinnacle feature to the east and 
uh, that's waypoint 10 updated. Um, but we really have the choice to do either one, depending on whether we want to get to the top of that pinnacle or whether we want to skirt along the edge of the steep um, slope that um, comes in from the west. So my, uh, you know, my thoughts would be maybe we do kind of both. We skirt along the western edge, but then we cut uh, 90 degrees and then go up to waypoint 10. Like, yeah, like make, an L, make an L shape, L shape. I mean, that's going to cost us a lot of time. Is the trade off there? So if if we want, oh yeah, we only have a little this, while left, don't we? Uh, Can we do kind of like a J shape instead? I, I, I would say if we want to get to waypoint 13, you're going to have to choose one or the other. Okay. Okay. Time-wise. Time um, yeah. So I know that um, Rennie had updated that. I don't know if the pe the pinnacle at 10 or the pinnacle at 13 is the priority, though. Um, if I, from a biological preference, I would say go towards the original 10 because waypoint, the updated one's going to have a similar height to a part of waypoint 12. So we're probably going to see similar communities in terms of depth. While waypoint 10 has that steep edge to it, which we could see some very thick um, cliff communities possibly. Yeah, I'm not. I'm just not sure that we're going to get to waypoint 13 either way because we've only got about two hours left of bottom time. True. Um, but yeah, I, I think maybe just going in at like point three or point four and just trying to get as far along, far south as possible makes sense. Thomas. Um, we could also ask, ask if... The only uh, thing about moving at point four is it's a lot less, we get a lot less time for zooms and... Right. Oh, well, we can do point three then. And sampling more difficult. Well, for rocks, we also want to collect on the red, the, uh, the ridges. I mean, where the original ten is, but... But that looks like it could be a steep, steep cliff yeah. face instead. But maybe like getting a rock like right here. In between 1.9 and 10? Yeah. Yes, right there. All right, I think the general consensus is to skip the updated 10. Okay. We could also inquire about There's extending the dive. In I'd the water on the lasers. I'm not sure that's been vetted yet See with that? our exhibition. Oh, no, there it is. Fish. The lasers. Yep. Or Neil. Um, but it seemed like they already shortened the dive, didn't they? I'm sure they had a reason. No, we started it at 11 yesterday. So <laughs> it's it's he it's just a, for a 24-hour period is what he put on the board. Okay. They actually didn't start the dive until like 12. Oh yeah, it was 12. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. Like it feels like they already shortened the dive. But I, th I think that was just to give people more time around lunch and not have it be like a total crush on the team. Yeah. Um, we can find out um, at uh, end of our end of our watch we can see what they want to do Go for zoom. I believe this is a Bathy Sora day. Trying to find the right page for that. I heard Bathy and I was reminded of Bathy Pathies. Bathy Pathies. Bathy Pathies. Mm -hmm. We saw several of those, but I just didn't mention it because we were talking. <laughs> the Thippathies. Okay, I'll not find the ID for this fish right now. I swear I was under eel's other, but... Whoa! Oh, what? Oh, this one way? It was just moving fast. Ah. Yeah. 